I would like to welcome you to this wonderful and rather unusual conference. In an open and impartial atmosphere. The now is starting now. just to use a thing which will connect us to Jerusalem. I know of two countries in the world in which, which uh, national anthem contains the name Jerusalem. One, of course, is the Israeli anthem, national anthem, the <coughs> Hatikva, the hope, ending with Eretz Zion Virushalayim, the land of Zion and Jerusalem. And you won't believe it, maybe you know it, I don't know that the other one is England. England doesn't have a national anthem. Please don't confuse it with the United Kingdom or Great Britain, for whom we sing, you sing, God Save the Queen. But England doesn't have an official national anthem, but it has an unofficial one. And this is the famous poem by William Blake, beginning of the 19th century, Jerusalem. I will not read the entire poem here. You sing it, it has also a very catchy melody. Uh, which is about only a century old, but if we just, I translated it for our uh, uh, people here into Hebrew, if you like, and I will just read the last uh, stanza, which says, I will not cease from mental fight, nor shall my sword sleep in my hand, till we have built Jerusalem in England's green and pleasant land. And in Hebrew, this is Jerusalem, Anglia, Morik. And this is what I'm coming to do, uh, to build our Jerusalem, which is not as green as yours, uh, in this country out of grayish and light brownish colors and a lot of dust. This is what archaeologists usually eat for breakfast. And I hope that I bring to you a just a small piece of what we are doing and what we learn out of these stones. So you have a Jerusalem, you can even sing it, open YouTube and you'll find it uh, there. Uh, I take you back to the late Second Temple period, as we call it, or early Roman period in the historical record. Jerusalem, the great Jerusalem, the temple city, which was later destroyed by the Romans in the year 70 of the Common Era, that is about 2,000 years ago. This is the temple city, and uh, I would like to learn something, or to show you what we can learn something about that city. It was the city within the land of Judea uh, where the Jewish people lived independently, more or less, as, client, as a client nation, to the Romans, and uh, this is important. Judaism, as you know, of course, is a monotheistic faith, the belief in a single God whose abode, whose residence is in Jerusalem. This is one particular thing about uh, Judaism, but there's another one which is usually ignored. Judaism in those days permitted also a single place of worship within the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And this was very peculiar against what happened in the world around, whether among the Greeks or the Romans or the Edomites or the Phoenicians or in the realm of the Middle, ancient Middle East or even greater, the greater ancient world, if you like. Only a single place of worship. I counted, I took Rome as an example, I started to count the temples which were erected there in the uh, Republican and Imperial times, and after 60, I stopped. This was enough to make the point. <coughs> 60 temples, and here only one. Well, this aspect of Judaism is what developed, perhaps created, but I don't have now the time to argue about this, but developed one important phenomenon, and this is pilgrimage. Pilgrimage is when people come to see their Lord, their God, in his place of residence, to pay him their respect, to receive his grace, his assistance, if they are in time of need. And, and uh, 
they have to come to him, whether it's from the other side of the city of Jerusalem or whether it's from Galilee, uh, from the villages in Galilee, or even from more remote places like Egypt, where a large community of Jews lived, or in Asia Minor today, Turkey of today. We have information in the historical record of Jews living in all those places. And we have information that Jews from these places came to Jerusalem. For this, uh, the Jewish faith actually uh, appointed three main festivals, the, the, the main holidays or festivals. Pesach, or Easter in English, uh, is maybe the main one. Uh, Shavuot, or Pentecost, uh, is the second one. And Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, is the third one. And uh, actually, everybody could come whenever he or she uh, found it proper to do. But they uh, had these main three festivals to do it. Bringing their sacrifice, staying for some time in the city, going back to their home with their experience and, and whatever they have gained from this, uh, from this very important uh, occasion. So in those appointed times, the order of magnitude will be tens of thousands of people gathered in Jerusalem. Sure, more than thousands, probably less than hundreds of thousands, so tens of thousands of people gathered in Jerusalem. And for this, the city, the state had to see to, to a proper place. And this brings us to the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Let's have a look, let's get acquainted with the place. Well, Jerusalem seen from the west to the east, was first of all, point of reference, the old city wall, only 400 years old. <coughs> For Americans, by the way, it's very old. <laughs> and the vast rectangle of the Temple Mount, still standing today, uh, and we can see the old ancient walls all around uh, to admire to the huge size. On this, I would like to say a few words in a moment. A little bit closer, the Temple Mount, now seen from the southwest. And you can see the southern wall and the western wall, even beyond the picture over here. Almost 500 meters by 280 meters. And this is important. This is my first uh, element that I would like to uh, emphasize. You see here the map of Jerusalem of those days. Pay attention, in light gray is the Ottoman Turkish 400 years old wall. And the rest are remains and reconstructions of the fortifications and main uh, edifices of the early Roman or late second temple period with the Temple Mount over here. This is this vast rectangle with the temple inside. From the temple, of course, there's not a single stone left, but the Temple Mount retaining walls are there uh, in full bloom, one would say. I would like to stress four elements, archaeological ones, which support the phenomenon of pilgrimage. First of all, it will be the enlargement of the Temple Mount. This points to this, because Flavius Josephus, the contemporary historian of that particular time, a Jerusalemite, a Jew living in Jerusalem, in his uh, great works, uh, uh, describes uh, Jerusalem and tells us that King Herod, the a king in those days, the great builder in uh, the land of Israel in those days, uh, decided in his 18th year of reign, this is, would be the year 22 BCE, before the Common Era, to enlarge the Temple Mount. From a large Temple Mount, which was already there, about 500 by 500 cubits, as the historical record has it, which is about 200 by 50 by 250 meters, and uh, to enlarge, to double it, more than double the size of it. There are scholars who believe that this is just another manifestation of his megalomaniac uh, way of life. He was a builder. He built for himself palaces uh, in six, seven places only in the land of Israel. Jerusalem, Caesarea, Masada, very famous, uh, Herodium, Jericho, Mechvar, uh, Kipros, and maybe there are a few more that I forgot. And here comes with the most ambitious uh, uh, project to enlarge the Temple Mount area, to double it, more than double it, 
And this is megalomaniac, just another way to show himself. Off. And I say, no, this was done to meet a very uh, acute need in those days because the people who started to, to, to come to Jerusalem in larger and larger and larger numbers needed space. Particularly at Pesach, when the tens of thousands of people came with their animals of, to be sacrificed. About a sheep for every extended family. So several tens of, tens of thousands would bring several thousands of sheep. I don't know if you have ever seen so many uh, in your life. I went to see this, this process, by the way, continues till this very day with the Samaritans who see themselves, let's say, the true Israelites of ancient times. So there, a community of about 700 uh, slaughters every Pesach, 35 sheep. And here we deal with two orders of magnitude larger, tens of thousands. So imagine what was required to, to hold this feast every year again and again and again. Here you can see how larger this was done. It, there was a Temple Mount there, which is the yellow one, which we have a, quite a detailed description in the rabbinic writings, which was later surpassed or, or uh, closed within the Herodian Temple Mount here in green, as you can see. Today we see it usually in reconstructions like the one in stone in the Israel Museum premises uh, in its complete form, but I suggested once to an artist to show to us the picture of about midway between half a finished extension of the Temple Mount and you can see the old square with the old temple being enlarged. So in one place in our excavations in the foundation trench over here where later was here, that's the last course of the Temple Mount wall in the, on the west. We found a ritual bath, only partly excavated on this line, so I added here the lines of the stairs. This is very important because it reaches under the stones of the Temple Mount, the only place that we know of. And by the coins found in this uh, ritual bath, I'll come to those in a moment, uh, were found coins. And as you know, in archaeology, the latest coin in a certain locus uh, is very important because it gives us the date of whatever is built on top of it. It must be later. And the dates in this mekwe and the coin in this mekwe da was dated to the days of Pontius Pilate, which is about uh, 30 years after King Herod's death, just to show you that this undertaking took part from the 18th year of reign out of from 33 years of King Herod until long after his death, and actually it came to an end somewhere in the 50s of the Common Era. A large project. Uh, yeah, here it is a little bit more indicated, the mikveh, which is very important for dating. So the yellow thing was enlarged to the south, to the north, and to the west. Then few other elements were added, like the Robinson's Arch, to become the largest holy precinct in the Hellenistic early Roman period in the entire East. So this is one aspect, enlarging a, vast, a, a large Temple Mount into a vast. This is for the sake of pilgrimage, for the pilgrims. Another thing is that in addition or in conjunction with the temple and temple mount, the Jewish faith um, uh, constructed in a very elaborate code of uh, rules, of religious rules, which pertain to purity and impurity. Anything connected to the temple had to be done in a pure state um, which I will not explain now, this is very complicated, but uh, 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 entrance to the Temple Mount and its various parts of it inside was restricted to various uh, groups of people here, everybody, also Gentiles, non-Jews, 
to that part, only the Jews, further on, uh, only the men, uh, uh, then the priest, etc., finally culminating with the Holy of Holies uh, for the high priest uh, on a particular moment of the year. The, the material uh, relics or remnants of this doctrine of purity are the ritual bath or mikveh, mikvaot, which were invented, so to speak, in those days. This installation, a man-made uh, water installation, stepped and plastered, holding rainwater, was actually the main mean to enable somebody to turn himself from ritually impure to ritually pure. He just had to enter naked into the water, in and out, and this is it. Uh, I show you only one of these mikvaot, but we have, I have on my list more than 170 of those which were found in Jerusalem. Some of us here sitting here have contributed some of the mikvaot which are on my list, some of them uh, uh, well preserved, others only half a mikveh, which also was once a complete mikveh. But uh, they are found in two places, in private houses of the Jerusalemites on one side, and near the Temple Mount gates on the other side, enabling those who came from outside to enter the ritual bath, take a ritual bath, and enter the Temple Mount qualifying to do so by this act. So mikvaot is an invention of the second century BC and is in current use until today, consecutive use from those days until today. I know of two mikvaot in London from the 13th century before the expulsion of the Jews, which were found in excavations in, in, in the city of London. The third element which is important in our uh, in our list to uh, prove the existence of this phenomenon of pilgrimage are the open large water pools constructed in Jerusalem. We will see in a moment the pool of Siloam over here in the south and we will see also Bethesda or identified with Bethesda pool which is this double pool over here in the north today in the premises of St. Anne Church. Why build these large open pools which were filled in with aqueduct water drawn from the mountains of Hebron, 20-30 kilometers south of Jerusalem. This is for the pilgrims. I mean, the city had to provide water. You cannot bring with you uh, water supply for, let's say, seven days during Pesach, maybe even more. And this was done in this way. A uh, doctorate uh, students of my, David Gurevich, uh, uh, researched this topic and found only a single parallel in the ancient world to this. And this is the city of Mecca in uh, Saudi Arabia, which is also a pilgrim, pilgrimage city, who provided its frequenters with water. There even the problem is even more problematic, it's real, a real desert. So I bring you here only one pool, and this is the pool of Siloam, which uh, I had the honor to uh, excavate part of it. The rest is the garden. It is under the garden at the southern point of the city of David. It's a stone-faced stone uh, pool, and this was a happy occasion. Once men's uh, problems are our uh, delight, you see a, a, a pipe broke and filled this place with pure water and then I rushed the photographer and said, go quickly and take a picture because it will help people understand what, where is the pool, where was the water. Uh, this pool is peculiar, is, is outstanding in one respect because it's the only one which was filled in with spring water. There's only one spring in Jerusalem and it fills even today part of this pool with spring water and in this doctrine of purity and impurity uh, water is divided or in, in grades not only pure and impure, there are six grades only of pure water. Uh, so I told you it's a very uh, complicated uh, topic, but since this is filled in with spring water, it probably, I can probably relate it to the ver very famous uh, uh, story of Jesus from Nazareth 
a healing the person blind from birth, as the Gospel of John has it. Uh, just to remind you, he, uh, uh, this poor man was brought to him. He spits on the ground, smears the, 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 whatever he created there on his eyes and says, then go and wash in the pool of Siloam. And one can understand it simply, go, sh go wash yourself. You are smeared with this brown thing. And I say, no. He sent him actually to take a ritual bath in that big pool because it was with spring water filled in and it's actually top quality in this respect uh, for, of mikvaot. Yeah, we, our son is an ophthalmologist. Uh, my wife sits here and I always ask him, Udi, uh, do you use this method still? And he says, no, but I can make you an appointment if you like. And, <laughs> Uh, Bethesda pool in the north, in the St. Anne premises, which looks like a large mikveh. This was filled with rainwater, but it qualifies the moment it is full with rainwater. This is what we have today. And finally, my last point is a, a, a topic from the small world of small objects, as we say, cooking pots. Cooking pots, what do you like so much cooking pots? Well, they are found in the city and around the city in two peculiar concentrations. One of them is just abundant cooking pots. Igal Shiloh, my predecessor, has, has found in the southern tip of Jerusalem several hundreds of them, intact objects of 2,000 years ago. These were found in a cistern within the old city inside. Uh, Hilal Geva will probably uh, be in the area to tell us about uh, the houses of these cooking pots. And we have found in our excavations in two locations abundant cooking pots. What is this peculiar or strange phenomenon? This is one thing. And the other one, here these are uh, drawings of the cooking pots that we have found, one like the other. No, almost no difference. We know of cooking pots, we know it before, from private houses in the old city, in the upper city of Jerusalem, which, as I said, Geva will, will address later. This is the plan of one of the houses. And just to show you part of the repertoire of that house, and you can see here the cooking pots, but these are in the uh, good place within the house. Well, the house was destroyed by the Romans, but Whatever was there was left there. So you can see uh, uh, that they are part, a relative small part, let's say, we'll see in a moment the percentages uh, of the repertoire of vessels within the house. Uh, but we have another aspect of this, and with this I will uh, finish. We have noticed that on the southeastern outskirts of Jerusalem, just, this is the city of David, just the eastern slope, in this strange cut, which was cut by a broken pipe, which the municipality of Jerusalem refused to, to mend, and it did our work. It's simply the water every winter cut through here, uh, the side more and more and deeper, revealing that the entire slope is actually part of the city dump of the late Second Temple period. This I know by the coins found in it. Right? All of them date to the first century common era, up to the destruction by Rome. And you can see here just uh, behind the figure of this man standing there that there's nothing there. It's just rubble and rubbish and broken pottery and broke, everything is broken here, pottery and animal bones. Anything that cannot be recycled is there. So we decided to make a wet, sift of this rubbish and see statistically what we have inside it. Where we have put all the youngsters, the Palestinians from the village of Silwan, they've earned the summer, those, that summer uh, very well, uh, to pick out pottery, whatever is there which is man-made on one side or as bones, etc., on the other side. Leave aside the stones and uh, uh, pottery in huge amounts, coins, as you can see here, just taken after they were found, and the sifted material already uh, sorted out in the various categories. 
believe me or not, but we worked a complete summer, several months, spending about $20,000, which we received from National Geographic uh, Society, for this table. This and another table of the animal bones. This is only pottery. And you can see on the side, what we have is Jerusalem and city dump. The number and the percentage. Percentage are important, not the in numbers themselves. And you can see of the repertoire of what we have, and there's also a, a certain way to count the objects. I will not dwell on this now. But you can see that of the total 100% of objects which are represented there, cooking pots take 30%. All the rest, here you have jars and oil lamps and junglets and bottles, etc., etc. This by itself is an important datum, but what do we do with this? This was the first study of this kind, and I did not have any other dump of the late Second Temple period uh, to compare to. Uh, what we did is g going back to the upper city, to one of the houses, the house that we've seen before, and compare it to the number of complete objects which were found in the house. About a hundred objects were found there. And indeed, this is not enough statistically, but this is what we had at the time. And when you divide the objects in that house into their categories, you see that cooking pots take about 10%. And we ask ourselves, how is it possible? The rest is more or less the same, but how is it possible that houses were the repertoire of cooking pots takes 10% of the entire household, creates 30% in the city dump. Where did the rest come from? And, okay, and, and um, the only answer for me, unless somebody comes with a better uh, theory, is this is what the pilgrims have left. Because they are outsiders, they come for short periods of time to Jerusalem, they bring their food with them. They need a place to cook for several days. They buy, this is probably the cheapest type of object that they can purchase in the city. And they don't need to schlep it back to Galilee or to Alexandria in Egypt. This will certainly break on the way. They are very fragile uh, uh, vessels. And they abandon them, they leave it there and go back home um, happily ever after, as we say, because they, came, they go back with a very exciting experience. So it is the cooking pots which I think tells us pilgrims were here and used part and left us with part of their waste uh, just to testify that they were here. So here you have four elements which indeed are found only among the, all the cities of the ancient Middle East, only in Jerusalem, a single temple mount which is enlarged, and then this doctrine of purity and impurity which created the mikveh, the ritual bath. You, you know, this is today the, the best indicator for a house to say that that house was inhabited by Jews. And we have in the entire country, in this particular period, about, already about uh, 800 known mikvaot listed uh, in our lists, and uh, it is even supported by the fact that in the pagan cities along the seashore, the Mediterranean seashore, you don't find them, because these were not part of their uh, daily routine to purify themselves from this or that. And then the open pools and the abundant cooking pots. Thank you. <laughs>